Mr. Devin Arnold, how are you? I'm doing well, Don. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to be back on with you again. Yeah, likewise. I think our pre-show, you know, getting ready for this show was probably just as long as this episode might go. <laughs> Hopefully. yeah. I act act like we've never talked before. Act like yes. it's all new. First time. <laughs> First time. <laughs> uh, so Devin, thanks for it to join us on the Profit Tool Belt show. People may not know who you are. So Devin, who the heck are you? And what are you doing talking to a worldwide group of professional contractors and construction business owners? Yeah, so I, I live in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and I uh, am involved as a painting contractor and have been in the space for about 14 years now. Um, got into the space at a young age and kind of have worked my way through the, the peaks and valleys of, of running a, a you know, home service-based business. And uh, yeah, I've had a lot of great experiences along the way and, and think I've got a bit of, bit of knowledge to, to kind of share with those that uh, have kind of followed a similar path as, as mine. Yeah, I would say you do, but only because you and I share a very similar, what do they call it, an origin story, like how we started? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I painting. was a student painter. Yeah, and uh, and I think that's, for a lot of entrepreneurs out there in, in, in you know, construction, I think student painting is, is definitely one of those commonalities that, <clears throat> you know, kind of light, lights the fire uh, to to kind of continue on in, in business ownership and, and especially within the trades and in home service space businesses. Yeah. I, looking back at, uh, it was the best decision I made, but the heart, probably the most learning I ever had in one short period of time was being a student painter. And for people listening to the show that don't know what a student, Devin, what's a student painter? Right. So student painting is an opportunity that usually gets presented to university students um, that they have the opportunity to run a small painting business while they are off of school, usually for four months in the summertime. So from May to the end of August is when you can operate a small painting business. And, you know, the company will usually provide you with all of the framework, the mentorship, the training and guidance so that you can kind of get into a business on a very, very short term basis. You can make some pretty good profits while yeah. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. You know, a lot of students or, or a lot of people that get in, into business, it takes, you know, two, three years at a minimum before they become profitable. Well, they do it in a, in a four month timeline and, and yeah. everything is very, very quick. Um, you know, painting is good. It, it, you know, I've always said that painting is the vehicle in which students can learn how to run a business because, you know, for painting on, on a small time basis, the startup costs are generally low. Yeah. Most students are broke. Um, and when, you know, when you hit the summertime, that's when there's the most demand for painting services. Yeah. Um, and, and the so margins long as are you're, good. They, yeah, margins repaint, are great. The margins are great. Yep. They're, they're good. And, and generally homeowners like to buy into young university students that are go-getters, high achieving students <laughs> using the business to, to well, obviously finance their university education and then also to, to, to learn business. Yeah. And so, well, I'll, I'll counter that point in one, just one sec. I just want to remind everybody that we're here today because, Devin, you've got a lot of experience around this topic, how to manage millennials and college students. So anybody who's listening that isn't a painter might be thinking, ah, I'll listen to another episode. I think you should listen to this episode because it's really about your experience in managing those students and any challenges that a contractor has with millennials, maybe their own kids, their own family, you know, friends and neighbors that they're hiring. Uh, and college students, you're going to get something out of this. But Devin, I have to go back on that last point you said when you commented that homeowners love to support students. So yeah. I, as you know, I ran a college painting business. I was with AAA student painters. Who were you with when you started? University first class painters. Oh, university first class. Okay. So I don't know if they were in my area at the time, but my biggest competition, two of, I had two big competitors in my area. Number one was this Croatian guy that painted everything by hand and his right arm was this, he looked like Popeye. Like his forearm was like my thigh and I'm an Italian <laughs> soccer player guy. My thigh yeah. is sizable. His forearm was a uh, comical, but the other competitor I had was the fireman. Yep. So my local fire station had a, a, a bunch of those guys did painting. And so whenever I went up head to head against the fireman, and the lady, the house was making the decision. I knew I was going to lose because they want to see firemen on the ladder, not some. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a tough so that's one. That's, that's my take on. One. That's my take on. Those are my two big competitors in in the area I had. That's funny. Uh, but Devin, what have you learned? Actually, paint us a picture. 
about how you got into this whole realm of painting and contracting because you've been at it for a long time 14 years you're very successful yeah. you've got two sides to your business you're killing it out here and you are doing it really with uh, millennials and college students which a lot of people find challenging so give us a bit of your background yeah. and yeah. So I, I first got involved with student painting in, in my second year of university. Um, and, and up until that point, um, I guess I, I'd always been entrepreneurial, um, always had a drive and, and passion for business, but never really had the opportunity to jump in, you know, on a bigger scale and actually have employees. You know, right. as, as a young kid, you know, I, I worked many, many jobs while growing up. Um, we, you know, we, I grew up out east in Nova Scotia and when it would snow, my brother and I would grab a shovel and we'd go cold calling through the neighborhood, um, make great money doing that. There was a time where we would pick our neighbor's flowers and, and sell them back to other neighbors on the block. Um, who can resist two young boys coming to a door selling flowers, right? <laughs> yeah, just a uh, full of flowers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so we had that drive and then, and then I kind of heard about this business student painting. And I said, well, you know, if, if, this is some framework that obviously can allow me to break out of the mold of, of doing the labor job on the construction site, which I had done. I had done concrete manufacturing, all kinds of different stuff where I was told when to show up, when to go home, when to take lunch and, you know, barely be able to afford my, my university tuition. And so I saw this as a way to break out of that and financially, and then also to, to, to kind of learn more about how to run a business. And so um, I, I did my, my undergrad and with a BCom and, like you alluded to earlier, I still say to this day that I, I learned more about running a business in four oh, months of, sure. of doing this than I did four years of university. And yeah, it's the life cycle of a fruit fly. You're you're born, yeah. you live, you die, and it's all in that short period of time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and so yeah, so I, I kind of took that great experience, and so I ended up you know doing the student painting thing right until graduation. Um, made a lot of money at it, had a lot of fun. I, I ended up running. My, my student painting business year round. I, I didn't just do it in the summertime. I um, oh, was wow. able to kind of- Yeah, we never had that option. Years. Yeah, it was it was great. I mean, especially the fall is a great time to, to be a painter because um, there's a, you know, there's decent demand in the marketplace and there's not a lot of competitors out there, you know, able to service it. So a lot of, a lot of people are booked up. So if you have the production capacity, you know, it's, it, it can be a good time. So, uh, so yeah, so did that for, for three summers or three years, I should say, uh, up to graduation. And then- uh, realized I kind of wanted to stay in the business. Um, you know, I was having a lot of fun with it. The idea of going into banking or finance or, or anything like yeah. that and sitting behind a desk all day, every day, oh. that's just not me. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people on, on the podcast can probably relate to that. Um, yeah. And so I said, well, I've got something going here. I'm making pretty good money at it. It, it does allow me to, to kind of have the lifestyle that I want and yeah. grow something that, that I'm in complete control of, um, which, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Which is different. Well, I don't mean to cut you off, but you know what occurs to me as we're as you're talking is that there's a lot of guys listening to the show, men and women listening to the show who've got kids and they're saying, you yes. know, my my highest point of pride and achievement will be if I could hire my son or my daughter to work in my company. And then, you know, in my experience as a business coach, I actually see the other side of that where now let's say they do hire just for the sake of it. Let's say that they're a roofing company or a HVAC company. So you hire your kid to work for your HVAC company and they never have outside experience. So all they yeah. know is how to be a dad's HVAC company or mom and dad's HVAC company. Do you think the experience that somebody gets being a student painter would be valuable enough that it could transfer to then working in a family HVAC roofing, plumbing, concrete, electrical business? Yeah, absolutely. I think when, you know, from what you're talking about, you know, somebody jumping right into the family business, I think a lot of times you're a little bit too close to the sun and, <laughs> you know, you've, you've, you've grown up in the same household, you know exactly how everybody ticks. And, and it, there's a lot of value in, in stepping outside of that for a little bit, um, you know, getting some some different perspective yeah. on, on how yeah. to run a business. And, and, you know, I think everybody would agree that you know, the more people that you can surround yourself with that are highly successful in business and business ownership. Well, just through osmosis, you're going to obviously bring in a lot of a lot of the good points of that. And then if and when, you know, you, you do jump back into mom and dad's business, um, you can bring a lot of different perspective. Yeah. Um, you, you, you know, you, you can add a lot more value than just trying to jump straight into that. Which can yeah, be tough. you get perspective, I guess, because otherwise you think that the way you said mom and dad's the way the family business is run is the only way you see business being run. And then you, you aren't able as the incoming 
you know, family member to add a lot of value. Yeah. Because you don't know other systems and processes and ways of doing things. And I'm thinking right now, I was speaking for a roofing association, a commercial roofing association. And one of the members, uh, the, the family business had just sold. So it's a dad and a son. You got the son at this point is 50. Like, right. There's got, we have to have a better name for this when you're a 50 year old kid. But yeah. uh, so the dad and the son, they sold the business. Well, the dad at that point, he's older. He's like, okay, I took the money. It's RV time, RV and golf, whatever he wants to do. He's but the, the son, quote unquote, what's he going to do? His only life experience is being the VP of his family business. And so he can't really transfer that to another company because it's run by another family. And he's a roofer and he only knows the roofing business and the way they did roofing commercially. Where's the transferability of skills? And so he found himself in a, a bit of a lurch and, and I'm not going to get into it too much, but it was affecting him personally and deeply. He couldn't redefine himself. He had nothing, nothing to fall back on. Yeah. He had a couple of bucks. Don't worry. They, they made yeah. some money, but he, yeah. he didn't have a lot to fall back on skill wise to go do the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the point of business, a lot of times when you're doing that transition is, is to, you know, get better with, with that transition, you know, to grow into new avenues that, that maybe, you know, mom or dad or, or the family business hasn't done yet. Yeah. And so when there's, you know, fresh blood coming in, it's, it's, you know, those new perspectives, it's, you know, new avenues of revenue and, and all of those things. And so if you're just kind of coming right through the, the family tree there to jump right into that, you're not, you know, you're kind of closed off a little bit. And so yeah. if you have the time to jump outside and get some different uh, perspective, then, then that's value. <laughs> well, there you go. There's an endorsement from you and I on the student painting industry and however it looks in the city you live in. Yeah. Um, but what have you learned getting back to our, our main topic at hand, which I think is what most people have dialed in for is how do I manage these darn millennials and yeah. college students? They, you know, enter, I could say all these things about that generation which by the way, were said about my generation and your generation and the generations before, of course we forget about that, right? So, but what have you learned about managing millennials? Well, I I think that millennials are are a little bit misunderstood, especially in the contracting space. Um, Because if you look at the contracting space, I I think it is, you know, an industry where, you know, not much has changed over, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of, of how we do business. You know, the plumber's still a lot of times doing the same kind of actions as far as how they're plumbing a house or repairing. The painter's still, you know, using the roller and the brush to apply the paint. Um, when we're looking at bringing in young people into our industries, we have to be aware that the way that they want to do business and how they want to work is a little bit different than the way we've always done things, mm. right? And so, you know, with, with what I do now, I manage, you know, these university students uh, throughout the summertime as a part of, of one of my businesses. And, and you know, we, we bring in students that, that are, you know, obviously high achieving, you know, they, they have a lot of passion for business, um, but they also need, you know, uh, 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 I guess a plan for how they're going to uh, excel in, in this role. And in, in construction, a lot of times it's, you know, you're hired to do this, you're a laborer or you're, you know, a, a, a car- carpenter's assistant and that's all you do, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's bring day in, day out. Nails. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and you're under my thumb while you're on the job site. Um, and, and that's what you do. And, and I think those days are gone or, or they should be gone as, as we kind of transition into, you know, 2021. Um, and so, you know, through through the years, we've learned a lot as well. Um, we've we've integrated technology into the way that we do business as well. Um, so one example of that is that we we actually hired a couple coders and we built an, an estimating app for our managers. And oh. so now when we go out and we do quoting, for example, we use an actual in-house estimating app that helps our managers come up with quotes and for a pricing system. And then we use Bluetooth printers in our vehicles to be able to print them out and actually present them to the homeowner. And so that's an example of kind of integrating technology and fitting that with the expectation um, of, of a young person. And, right. and so, yeah, so, so that's kind of uh, one of the main ones is, is just really making sure that you're coming at this from a positive frame of mind and in, in an open frame of mind where you have to realize kind of that, that the young people that are coming into the workplace now, you know, they grew up with a lot of, um, you know, immediacy with, with kind of their upbringing. Obviously yeah. this is, you know, the, the first 
demographic of, of, of young people that, that had the internet for everything they needed to do. Um, yeah. and, and I suppose, you know, I technically am, am a millennial. I'm, I'm on the upper scale of that. Um, but I can remember when I first jumped on the internet for the first time, you know, I was, I think it was in grade five or six. I think. Oh, uh, killing you know, me, man. Who, Devin, you're killing yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I remember I pulling up to a pay phone in my territory as a painter and I had to always have quarters on me to make my follow-up phone calls I from this pay that. phone. But there was a pay phone you could park at, you know, and I could, if I parked just right, I could stay in my car and dial or my van. I had a hand painted yeah. Dodge tradesman van. And when I say hand painted, that makes it sound like it was really good. I yeah. used a roller and a can oh, of red Marine paint. It was bad. Well, I'm sure you stood out. <laughs> I stood out. Yeah. That vehicle actually got condemned on me while I was driving it. The cops oh. pulled me over and condemned the vehicle because there's a massive hole in the floorboards. Yeah. 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 All class here. Rubino's all <laughs> class. Um, so what do you, when you're, when you're hiring millennials though, and granted you're going to be looking for something different because you're looking for leaders amongst the millennials to be, you know, franchisees of your, uh, of the, the franchising side of your painting business. And you've got a trade painting side too, where you do commercial residential interior right. exterior, right? But what are some of the flags you look for to see whether this person's even worth adding to your team? Cause not everybody no. is who we want to hire. So what are some of the flags you look for? I mean, a lot of them are fairly common. I mean, you know, we want to make sure that the individual has good work ethic, you know, first and foremost. Um, and, you know, whether it be the millennials or, you know, the generation behind them, which is I think Gen Z, uh, which oh, we have to be cognizant here that that Gen Z, I looked it up a couple of days ago, that's 1995 to 2010 and so i think this t-shirt's 1995 I think <laughs> yeah. this might be <laughs> that's funny well i honestly i mean uh, you know somebody born in 1995 can be applying for some of the positions that you have available and and wow. so that's that's even different and so so yeah so looking for the work ethic um and 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 the drive i think you know you do need to have that no matter how old you are um, right. and so once you find that individual that obviously has the drive and, and ambition to, you know, come into your business, you then have to kind of create the, the, the platform for them to succeed. You know, like I was saying before, you know, you can't just put them to work right away and, and you know, in, in a mundane role without much uh, opportunity for growth. You need to be that leader and that mentor for them. Um, to, to be able to show them the path to, to kind of uh, excel through, the, through their learning. So uh, I get that, but I'm a small business listening to this show and what growth is there? I'm the owner. I need a technician in the field to do framing, roofing, HVAC, plumbing, pest control, slab jacking, mold remediation, uh, renovations, demolition, all those things. There is right. no growth. I'm the owner. All the yeah. positions are, are what they are. You know, and maybe you're going to be a junior or a senior or something. How do, right. how do we translate that into, you know, making the most of this employment group? Because we still want to bring them in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've always tried to focus on over-professionalizing the painting service. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we don't focus just on swinging the brush and, and, and doing the cut line. A lot of times, you know, some examples, I guess, of, of, you know, roles that you can put those individuals, those young people in is, you know, a customer service. You know, not only are you you know, helping with the, the carpentry, but we want to integrate, you know, your oh. ability to help on the client side of things, right? right? You know, let's utilize your communication skills. Let's utilize your ability to handle, you know, email or for example, social media, social media you know, right. do you have an Instagram page? Do you have a Facebook page? Are you able to show, you know, those that are up and coming, you know, your work, you know, whether it be a window cleaning company or, or even a framing company. Yeah. You may think it's a mundane service, but at the end of the day, it, it can show well on, on social media and nobody's better to handle that than a young person. Um, a lot of the cabinetry guys will do that. People will yeah. do that because they, they'll make side projects. What, you know, it doesn't matter what they're making, but they're making something and they love wood. When you're in cabinetry, you love wood, right? And yeah. so they'll make something out of wood and then they'll have a social media page for that. So your suggestion is put that to use. You know, if they're Absolutely. on your roofing crew, make sure they post three pictures of your roofing jobs this week with the right yeah. tags and mentions and 
Yeah, that's a really good yeah. idea. Also too, you know, getting online reviews for your business, um, which, which a lot of people struggle with, you know, a lot of contractors don't, yeah. don't push it too hard, um, but it is, and, and has already become, you know, very important to, to, you know, the way you rank online when people search for your yeah. services and, yeah. and, and, you know, coming up with an email template on, or, or a messaging template on, on how you're going to push that out to your clients that you've completed work for a lot of owners. And, and I can, you know, be faulted for this as well we're busy handling a lot of different things. And that's one thing that can really fall by the wayside. And, and, and you have good intentions to do it. But a lot of times, if the systems aren't in place, to get that push notification sent out to your homeowner once, twice, three times, or incentivize them in different ways, you know, if that doesn't happen right away, it's not, it's, it's not gonna happen. You're, it's you're, funny you say that because uh, leaving trust breadcrumbs in the market is actually one of the secrets. I just wrote a book, Devin. I don't know if I told you. It's called Construction Millionaire Secrets. And right. so there's about 20, 21 secrets that I've I keep coming across all the time. And I just they're just consistently out there. And one of them is you need trust breadcrumbs in the market. You know, in the old days, it was a referral. Like, you know, we painted Devin's house and Devin loved us, so he referred us to you. And nowadays it's online stuff. So if you can build those trust breadcrumbs and have the, and I'm I'm paraphrasing you get the, the millennials and these college students use their special skills on social media, maybe tack it onto their job description and, uh, and get them adding value to the company in other ways than being on the tools. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and not saying that they have to, you know, not be involved in the tools, you know, that, that can no, still on top be, of, I'm saying yeah. just, yeah, add it on. Yeah. That, and, and you can incentivize simple. them as well. You know, you can say, listen, for every review or five-star review we get, you know, we're going to give you a 20 or $30, whatever grocery gift certificate or whatever it might be that, you know, probably yeah. not groceries for the millennials, but uh, Starbucks but, card. Yeah. Starbucks, whatever it might be. Um, but th those are definitely things that, that can help. Um, I'd also heard one time that uh, one, one cool thing that a contractor did for his younger employees getting uh, those five-star reviews, they did it. It was called darts and donuts where for every five-star review, the employee yeah. would get a dart. And once every two weeks, Everybody would meet for donuts and coffee and yeah. the owner would bring in a dartboard and everybody who had gotten their reviews within the last two weeks had a number of darts. Some people would have one, some people would have, you know, six or seven. Everybody would stand on the line and you throw your dart at the board and whatever number you hit, that's what you got in cash. And they had cash right there just to incentivize everybody. Wow, what a really great idea. I thought, it, yeah, it was great. And, and it really turned it into a fun game and yeah, obviously really gets the culture going a little bit as well, which, you know, with, with the topic we're, we're kind of going over here is, is very important. And yeah. so, you know, little things like that, that, that you can really kind of key in on uh, to build uh, excitement around doing these extra things. Um, it, it just adds value to the position and, and it gives, you know, younger people that, that, you know, notion that, Hey, this is a cool company. It's not just swinging the hammer. It's not just yeah. swinging the painty brush. These guys are doing different things. And as a business owner, that's great because now I can attract, you know, the best talent and I can keep them, you know, probably for longer than I normally would. Um, and, and hopefully bring them up throughout the company, you know, get them into a position of, of leadership and then get them into, you know, position of management, maybe later on. Um, that's the overall goal. So I'm just, you've got my head stuck now on the darts and dashboards, darts and donuts, darts and donuts, darts yeah. and donuts. because I'm imagining having to spackle the wall behind the dartboard. <laughs> and if you're doing it at a customer site, <laughs> you probably as painters, we're okay with that. We can do <laughs> yeah, it. Real we're quick. okay with that. But in my head, I'm already like, okay, listen, we got to make sure we do this. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how people look at, um, especially painting. It's, it doesn't, there's a low cost to entry. It's really not hard. Not hard at all to get into painting. And I remember doing interviews with people and, and they'd say, oh, yeah, here, I noticed you're looking for painter. I have a lot of experience. I'd be like, oh, great. What kind of experience? A lot of federal, a lot of federal painting experience, institutional stuff. <laughs> and we're not, you know, where I live, you're not allowed to ask. But that usually was code words for I was in jail. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and that was the skill they picked up in jail, which was federal institutional. Yeah. But it was like they were had been coached on what to say when they yeah. got out to say, I had a lot of federal experience, a lot of institutional work, really you know, painted a lot of grays and greens, you know, you're yes. like, oh, okay, well, you can't got be it. on my interior crew then. I'm sorry. Cause we got to, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, companies out there in the trades that are really good trades people, yeah. um, but they just need a little bit of extra help on, on running it as a business. Right. Um, well, that's what this show's about, Devin. I mean, this yeah. is not about, this isn't about being a better technician in whatever construction trade contracting trade we've got. This is about the business of the construction and contracting business, which is perfectly said, this is yeah. really about how to run any business and, and teaching business skills and bringing business skills into our company. Yeah, and it's podcasts like this that, that just adds so much value to contractors because if, if you go back 20, even 10, but 20, 30 years ago, you're a contractor out there doing this by yourself so without long. really any mentorship yeah. around you. And, you know, we run a franchise with Student Painting. We have a professional franchise that, that we also operate um, called Elite Trade Painting. And that, that obviously provides a lot of um, mentorship and guidance and that kind of thing. You know, it's not for everybody, but for those people that are, are out on their own, um, you, you need a community around yeah. you to, to kind of improve your systems and, and hold you accountable too. You know, if, if you're running things by yourself, it's very easy to kind of let things slip a little bit. But if it's, you have a community, it helps. If, if you have, it, I just, I think back to the days when I was a painter and the community was the paint shop, the paint store. Because <laughs> yes. how many questions would I go ask the manager of that paint store about an application or, a, you know, how you're going to you know, deal with a certain problem. And he or she was the only person I could talk to. Now, just before our show, I admitted 10 more people to the, we've got a free Facebook group called Contractor Strategy Group. Well, yeah. those guys are all joined in with the other couple hundred people that are in that group. And they get to talk about, what was the, the flavor this week was something about time management. Mm -hmm. Who else can you talk to? And then, you know, so the, the power of these online tools are really there if you take advantage of them uh, and make them your own. Yes. Let me let me ask you this because you've got an interesting overlay of skills, Devin. You deal with students. You deal with uh, I'll say not students. I'm sure because of your uh, regular contracting side. So you got the franchise side for the student painting. You got elite trade painting, the other business that does the residential, commercial, interior, exterior, exterior. How would all of this work if you didn't have systems in place? Would the millennials be able to operate? Would you be able to operate like? How big a part does systems play in your operation? Yeah, it, it's everything, right? Um, as, as a business owner, I can't be the Winging cook, it. the server, the bartender, the dishwasher. It's not possible. And, you know, you need to have those systems to, one, provide your clients with the service, you know, from job to job to job that, that they come to expect from elite trade painting from university painters. Yeah. That's first and foremost, you know, you have to service your clients. The systems are for them, but also too, you know, in order to attract the right people for your, for your job and for that's your, where for I was business, going with this in order to attract those people, they, they don't want to work in chaos. They need systems. No. No, yeah. absolutely. And, and what a time to be running a contracting business because there are so many new, um, you know, technologies and, and, and options out there for, for business owners. Um, a, a number of years ago, as an, another example, we switched over to a time tracking app oh. and where all of our employees, they will the heavens in, open up the when app. you do time tracking. Isn't it great? It was a game changer for us. And yeah. You know, there, there's a number of companies out there that are doing it. Um, it it's, it's only getting better. There's been actually a huge, a couple big acquisitions in, the, in that space where a few of the really big um, service space companies have, have acquired some of the smaller guys. But um, from, a, from a small business perspective, I mean, for me to be able to open up my phone at any time, be able to look at exactly who's clocked into what job site, yeah. uh, everything's done through GPS. So if they leave the job site, I'll get a notification if they forget to clock out or if they have to take lunch or whatever it might be. It provides much more transparency. It gives our employees a lot more kind of security and, and also to, um, to just let them know a little bit more aware of where they're at hours per week. Um, if, if they, you know, are going overtime or anything like that. So that's just another example of something that, that changed our business quite a bit. God. I remember when I was painting, I had to take a watch and you know, McDonald's used to give away a little promo digital watch and yes. I would attach it to the crew kit. So my crew knew <laughs> how much time they had on things, but it, I was a kid. I, it didn't occur to me to say, you could get your own watch, my friend. Yes. <laughs> right. And, and, and cause I was a kid, they're like, well, we can't tell how much time it takes cause we don't have a watch. And I said, well, you should, if, even if I'd said we should get a watch, they'd say, well, you've got to get me one. Right. And yeah. I was like, what did I know? Right. Now they've got phones and with the phone, you can tell if they've left the job site. Yes. 
Yeah. So they can't and put one over on you either. Not that they would, but yeah. Yeah. No. You, I mean, now, now you don't have to stress about, you know, are the hours per month being fudged or are they being, you know, increased if, you know, if, if an employee finishes at, you know, three 30, are they putting, they stayed till three 45. Well, maybe in the old days they could have, but now they can't, which, you know, keeps everybody honest, which is a good thing, but also too, it takes that, you know, stress off of the business owner of, you know, the hours that are being reported are honest hours. Oh. And also too, I can utilize that for tracking on, you know, where I'm at budget yeah. wise on the project. Right. So yeah. I can pull it up today and say, okay, well, I'm looking at 45% labor on Mrs. James job site. We've got one day left and, and, you know, we're sitting at 30%. So we're, we're in the money there. Um, little things like that enable you to manage these jobs a lot tighter. And obviously, like you said, it increases profitability and relatively the, the apps themselves or systems are pretty cheap to use. Yeah. Uh, people might be wondering, but what kind of time tracking app do you use? So we use uh, two. Um, we've used T Sheets, which yeah. is is one of the big ones. Integrated um, with QuickBooks, right? Yep, yep, yeah. which is great. That's the one we're mainly using, um, and we're also looking at Vericlock as well. Oh, um, I don't know. That and uh, yeah, actually, Vericlock is one that was uh, started in Vancouver uh, by a painting company. Believe it or not. <laughs> there's, you know what? I'll tell you. I don't think there's any other trade that has more gimmicks and gadgets than painting. I, I love going to the painting store just to see the new thing they've got. Cause there's always some new yeah. thing. Yeah. And half of them are a flash in the pan for, for the actual painting tools. Uh, some of them are good, but uh, yeah. there's a lot of them out there that, you know, your average homeowner will have in a, in a, in a heartbeat. And then they'll want to use those on your job site or, or use them when you come in to paint their house. But I, I have to remember that at one point, a roller was new technology to painting. Wow. Before that, it was all my Miroslav, guy that Croatian <laughs> guy that I was competing with all by forearm um, so uh, do you use jobber or any other apps like that for scheduling and tracking we we don't use jobber just because the in-house uh, management software that we built is basically jobber oh, right? okay it, so you it, built it, your it own. is that Great. yeah Great. so we built the whole in-house estimating we've got a scheduler we've got a whole invoice platform we've got everything in-house and and we built that about six years ago now uh, it took mm. took a while to build but we did it um it's you know always being you know updated and, and it, it's a constant you know uh, piece of work on that side of things but um but yeah without that i i honestly don't know how we would be able to to operate and and a lot of my um you know acquaintances that, that run small contracting businesses you know whether they're using jobber or another you know like service everybody's should be using on something. something like using that. Some, yeah. yeah. There's no yeah, excuse to really not use to. something. One yeah. of the frustrations that I hear in my coaching, both in the group coaching I do and the one-on-one -on -one is when there's somebody who's entered into a company. So whether they bought a company or whether they're, you know, a, a family member who's sort of worked their way into a company is the lack of systems they find really frustrating, frustrating. Um, maybe we'll make this one of our ending points, but are systems ever done being built? Like what, what's your philosophy about business systems in construction and contracting? Yeah, I, I think the philosophy is always adapting and looking for better ways to do things. And, and, and I think, you know, talking about millennials and, and young people, you know, there are a lot of times bringing those ideas and those, those kind of new ways of doing things into the workplace. And a lot of times they, they take a lot of time to actually be adopted and say, okay, well, maybe, maybe this is a good way of doing things. Um, you know, like, like a, like a job or an in-house management system, you know, a lot of yeah. older people, you know, stuck in the, in the way that they've been doing things for years would say, well, it's working for me now. So why would I change? And in business, if you don't change, you're dead. And in the contracting space, I think that if you are a little bit more open to adapt, to allow the young people in to, you know, change on the system side of things, mm. then you will win. There's a lot of benefits to doing that because we are in an industry that I see it, you know, time and time again, where people are not changing quick enough. Um, you know, and, and you look at other professions out there, they, they change, you know, with the direction of the wind um, as far as, you know, new systems and, and ways to do business. And so I think we should be open to that. And, and I think it'll, it'll benefit, you know, you as a contractor, um, as you go about that. And, and so long as you're doing it, you're going to attract the best people. And a lot of times those, those are the millennials, the, the young people coming up. Don't be afraid of millennials. They're no. good. No. And we, you know, like I said, that's just the lightning rod. Now millennials are the lightning rod. Now, a couple of generations ago, 
people were worried that hippies weren't going to be able to work. And now, <laughs> now I'm, I'm younger than what the hippies were. And those would be, you know, the bosses in some other companies. So, you know, stop, yeah. stop, stop laying so hard on the millennials. They're just a product of the time they grew up in. And we should be able to use that as leaders and understand the strengths of it. That's what I'm picking up from you. Yeah. And also too, we have to be aware that, you know, we're in 2021. So, you know, your, your oldest millennial is usually 38, 39, maybe 40. They're now becoming your clients as well. Mm. Right. So as we kind of progress here over the next number of years, that, that mix of, you know, your millennial clients is going to grow. And so thinking about this, taking a proactive approach to the way that you do things, you know, when we go and quote for younger clients, the way they see us doing business, they really, really vibe and, and really kind of come on board with that. They say, yeah. wow, you guys are progressive. This checks in with exactly what I like about a company. Whereas if we're competing with another contractor that's, you know, writing a price on the back of a business card or, 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 or might exists. just be stuck. Devin, that it still does. exists. It does. It does exist. And <laughs> But, but again, it's, it's all about over-professionalizing the service using these new technologies. And, yeah. you know, when, when, we, when we are, you know, attracting clients of that age demographic, these things really matter. And so, you know, from a millennial standpoint on the employee side and the customer side, I think uh, it's something that, that, yeah, you should be open to change with. I love it. That's a great tie down that, that don't forget, you're not only hiring millennials, those are now your clients. And yes. so you have to have systems, of, you have to look like the kind of company they want to do business with. Absolutely. Like shared drive where all the documents are handled, sending them, uh, you know, using uh, Panda docs or something else to sign PDFs remotely. You don't have to show up on yep. site using zoom teams yes. or geez, Facebook yep. live to, yes. to have your meetings because of everything else that's going on in the world. Yep. Even yeah. payments too. Um, how you accept payment is a big one. What do you mean uh, a bag uh, of cash? Is it okay? Anymore? <laughs> yeah. Meet me out back and uh, we'll, we'll count cash in the alley. <laughs> that doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of clients want to pay by e-transfer. They want to pay, you know, credit yeah. card obviously can be a hit or miss one with the fees that, you, that contractors get hit with. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways that, that are coming out that, that you can be open to there. Yeah. Devin, thank you. This has been great. Very eye opening. Uh, yeah. I'm sure people took a lot of notes on this. If if somebody wants to find you or find out more about you, what uh, what are the two companies that you're? Because running one's not enough, Devin. You're running <laughs> two. What are your two? Yeah, construction staying companies? in the painting, staying in the painting space. Uh, so University Painters is our student uh, painting service here in Canada. We're we're nationwide, uh, and then also to the professional painting division is Elite Trade Painting, and that's where we kind of do more high end residential, bigger commercial projects, yeah. uh, new home builds, that kind of thing. And uh, you can find us at elitetradepainting.com or follow us on Instagram. We've, we've got a lot of cool stuff up there. Um, our of course you do. El- yeah, you, <laughs> you have to, right? Of course you gotta utilize, yeah. You got to utilize this stuff. Um, so yeah, so our handle for that is uh, elite double underscore trade double underscore painting. Ah, double underscores now. Is that where we are in the world? Double underscores? We are, yes. Finding the, the right handle is, is becoming harder and harder. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Devin, thank you. I really appreciate it. I know you've added a lot of value to people. So thank you. Um, have a great day and I hope to catch up with you again soon. That's great. Thanks for taking the time today. Talk All right. To you soon. Thanks. Bye.